Hi, my name is Sean Plass, and I am the program manager for the Northeast region um, for Call to Recycle. We're a stewardship organization out of Atlanta, and we specialize in battery recycling. Today, I'm going to talk about recycling as risk management when it comes to batteries. Typically, we think of recycling as environmental ma management, but we're going to focus on risk management today. I have a friend who works in fire safety and he wanted to demonstrate the power of a lithium battery in an iPad. So he went to a waste facility. He cleared out an open space, put a table in the middle and placed an iPad on it face down. He then took the director of the facility, um, clothed him up in a smock and uh, apron, goggles, gloves, all of that, brought him to the middle, gave him a hammer and nail and said, drive that nail into the back of the iPad. The director did this and the ensuing explosion drove that nail straight up two stories and drove it into a metal roof above. So the question we want to answer today is why did this happen? Why have batteries become so powerful? Why was um, this person in a waste facility demonstrating this? And what does this mean for us moving forward? This is a fire that happened in January of 2020 um, in upstate New York, which is my region. Um, they attribute it to a cell phone um, that was uh, crushed and the battery caught on fire and burned down the facility. It's hard in these situations to ever know if a battery was involved and these have been happening around the country and it's often hard to collect the evidence, but we feel very strongly about this. Um, it's a safety issue for the employees. Um, when these facilities burn down, they're very expensive to rebuild and replace. And if you can rebuild them, your insurance costs go way up. So this is something we really take seriously, a call to recycle. And that's what my presentation is meant to enforce. There's a fable from ancient China about a young man who became emperor. And the first thing he wanted to do was conquer his neighbor, the neighboring empire. But he didn't know how to do it because he was fairly young. So he went to the top sage in the country, a meditation master, and said, can you teach me how to conquer my neighbor? And the sage said, well, I'll do it for a fee. And he took out a chessboard and he said, every month you will put one grain of rice on this checker. The second month you're going to double that to two grains of rice. In the third month you'll double that to four. In the next month you'll double that to eight and 16 and so on until we get to the end of the chessboard. And that will be my fees for teaching you how to wage war. So the emperor thought about it and said, well, that doesn't sound like a bad deal and agreed to it. So the sage told him how to conquer his neighbor. He went off, did that and began to pay the sage in rice. First one grain of rice, then two, then four, eight every month. Well, strange thing happens when you get to what's called the second half of the chessboard those numbers become in the hundreds of millions and then billions and escalates very quickly. So very soon the sage had all the rice in the kingdom. Now the emperor realized that he had been had and quickly had the sage beheaded, executed. But this fable is actually demonstrating something else, which is a doubling, an exponential growth. Here's what it looks like in a graph. And what's actually describing is computer science. This is called Moore's Law. Um, in the 1970s, Mr. Moore predicted that the number of bits on a computer chip would double every 18 months forever. And people thought he was crazy, but he eventually became the CEO of Intel and became a chip manufacturer. And it's proven to be true that every 18 months, the number of bits on a computer chip doubles. And this is called Moore's Law, and this is what it looks like as a graph. You can see how it grows exponentially. This is, in 1970, the number of bits on a chip. This is where we are right about now, and this is five years from now, 2025. So what, what it is saying is that computer processing power is going to explode exponentially in the coming years, and we are not prepared for that. It's going to change our society forever. This creates a process called convergence. Convergence is an integration of disparate technologies into a single integrated system. Basically, all these different things are invented, and then when they converge and come together, they create something that's never been created before. So some of these products right now are high definition video, 3D VGA cards. These are basically um, computer cards that were in chips that were developed for um, three dimensional video games. You've got 
AI, artificial intelligence. You've got now 5G cellular networks being built, which are powerful cellular networks, lithium batteries, and so forth. So all these things are being developed independently, but when you bring them together, they create something new. That something new is called emergence. It, an emergence is a scientific principle that the parts don't predict the whole. So for example, hydrogen gas plus oxygen gas gives you a liquid. So two gases come together to give you a liquid. That's not really predictable. But emergence is more than that. It's, it's basically saying three plus five equals cheese. It's that you can't scientifically predict something, the whole based on its parts. So let's go back to that slide. Tesla wanted to find a way to make self-driving cars. They took high definition video cameras and put a number of them around a vehicle and recorded everything that the car saw as it drove. They filtered that through 3D um, computer card. 3D video game computer cards and chips to process that information. Then they gave it to an artificial intelligence computer and said, learn to do what a human does. And so the machine taught itself how to drive. This is all connected through cellular, net cellular networks, which will soon be 5G, even more powerful. And the car is all based on a lithium battery. S and that's where you get something like the Tesla Model 3. I briefly worked for Tesla years ago. Uh, my friend had one of the first Model 3s in Vermont. And um, I've been through the self-driving mode where you basically type in an address, you're on the highway, the car puts on its own blinker, changes lanes, weaves in and out of, out of traffic. And then when it comes to the exit, puts on its own blinker, takes that exit ramp and stops at a light. So self-driving is coming, but nobody would have predicted that from high definition cameras and 3D um, video game cards and so forth. So these technologies are going to come faster and faster, and we're not going to be able to predict what they are. And many of them are going to be fueled by lithium batteries. This is what lithium battery growth looks like. So here's the manufacturing investment that companies like Panasonic, Samsung, all these companies invested in um, lithium battery manufacturing in recent years. And you can see the capacity has grown enormously. What that effect is, is that it's driving the cost of batteries down. So cost of lithium batteries have gone down dramatically. Simultaneously, the battery energy density, the power density is going up, which means batteries are getting smaller and smaller, but more and more powerful and more and more affordable. Some of them are also getting bigger and bigger and more powerful. So because they're becoming more affordable, becoming more commonplace, but they're also getting smaller, which makes them harder to catch. So they're coming into waste facilities in really small forms that you're not going to see, and they, they're very flammable, so they could cause fires. So this is going to be a continuing trend for the coming years. The Internet thing of things is basically this principle that all devices will be connected to the Internet. Currently, we've got about 10 billion of those devices worldwide. In the next five years, that's going to jump 500% to 62 billion. Simultaneously, there's a 400% increase in lithium manufacturing capacity. For example, this is a drone. Verizon predicts that they'll have 1 million of these connected to the internet through 5G cellular in the next couple of years. What that means is if you're getting married in Vermont, but your grandmother's in a nursing home in California and can't be there, you could have a drone live streaming video to her at her nursing home in California instantly. So she can essentially be present at your wedding. All these drones are operated by lithium batteries, rechargeable batteries, and these are gonna end up in waste facilities in a few years. So this is just one example of an, a, devi a device that's coming towards you. Here's some more devices. My friend has a, a son who loves basketball. This basketball has a battery and sensor in it that tracks how many dribbles, how many shots, um, how quickly he dribbles, sends it all to his phone for a workout spreadsheet, essentially. You've got headphones like I'm wearing right now, which are rechargeable. You've got electric motorcycles. I used to work in construction. All our saws were plugged in with cords. Now they're all mobile with lithium batteries. You've got keyboards, um, earphones. You've got chainsaws that are electric. One thing we're getting a lot of are electric lawnmower batteries. These are about to become robots too. We're getting a lot of requests to recycle batteries from robots that mow lawns and robots that vacuum hotels, robots that clean the floors in giant department stores. So everything is going to be connected to the internet with batteries. And then of course we've got giant airplanes and drones coming too. So what does this look like? I call this the crap app. We used to worry about recycling diapers because of the environmental issues. Well, now they're going to have little pods in them 
that if your baby uses the bathroom, it sends a signal to your cell phone to let you know that the baby needs to be changed. So now diapers can have batteries in them. So the question is, how are you as a waste facility going to manage convergence, all these technologies coming together, and the emergence, the unpredictability of what that's going to mean, and how that can increase the fire safety issues at your facility? If you're going to wait for regulation or legislation to kind of assist you, it's not going to come fast enough. Regulation and legislation moves fairly slowly, whereas this technology, as we looked at, is going to accelerate exponentially in the next five years. And why is that happening? Well, number one, when these technologies are, are invented, these companies have to capture market share really quickly because it's so easy to copy technologies now and, um, and mimic them. So companies work really quickly to capture the market, which means they mass produce as fast as they can. Another problem is all these batteries are often embedded in products, which means they're part of the packaging, which they might not even be covered for recycling by legislation. A lot of these products are also going to be manufactured overseas, which might have different recycling regulations and so forth, and different labeling um, issues compared to the United States. And finally, a lot of these are coming in through internet sales and services, which might not even be covered under local state regulation. For example, um, this device is pretty amazing. It's the electric scooter. I'm sure you've seen them before. Um, these came out kind of out in Silicon Valley area first. Uh, my sister lives in Los Angeles. These came out so quickly, they appeared everywhere on every street corner, and there was no way to handle them. The town wasn't ready for it. Uh, the neighborhoods weren't ready for it. A lot of people were tossing them into uh, um, the canals and stuff out there. So. What do you do with that? Well, Lime is now one of our customers. They came to us and said, how do we deal with the end of life um, for this product? And we now recycle all their batteries for them and their scooters so that they can be done in an environmentally responsible way. Another example would be um, vape machines. Nobody had really heard of vape machines years ago. Um, and now there's huge issues with them. For example, a school system in Minnesota reached out for our fireproof boxes because they were collecting so many of these devices from students um, that they were worried about fires in their schools. They were going to order like $40,000 worth of boxes, and we can't even recycle it because of the nicotine content. But that is happening worldwide. India is having issues with vape machines and so forth. So these devices are going to come out faster than regulation, faster than nations, states, cities can deal with them. So you have to be ready at your waste facility to anticipate this, these coming before any regulations are even in place. So what does this mean? Recycling is about environmental management, and it's also about risk management. And I'm going to walk you through sort of some of the ways to mitigate the risks when it comes to batteries. A little bit about us. Call to Recycle is a nonprofit. We are based in Atlanta, founded in 1994, so we're about 25 years old. We are a stewardship organization, which means battery manufacturers like Duracell, Energizer, and so forth, they pay us stewardship fees to run a nationwide recycling program. So we collect rechargeable batteries around the entire country and then recycle those. We've got 16,000 publicly accessible sites. Some of these are big ones like Lowe's, Home Depot, Staples, and so forth, and many are small towns or hardware stores or um, waste management districts. We've done about 144 million pounds of consumer batteries so far. We also have some fee-based services, which are sort of fire safety, which I'm going to get to, um, but this is this is our program, and I'm going to walk you through the evolution of that too. One of the things that encouraged us to evolve was this incident in Ju June 5th, 2017. This is a FedEx truck in Ohio. It caught on fire. Um, the investigation showed our boxes were in there with some batteries. Originally, they thought it was us. It turned out to be our competitors also had batteries in there, so we weren't ultimately responsible. But it really, really woke us up to the dangers. This driver um, could have been injured. Thank goodness he wasn't. Uh, but the truck was obviously damaged and was on a highway, which could have caused accidents and so forth. So we take this really seriously, and it's helped us evolve our business, and we wanted to help you evolve yours from our, our mistakes. This is the evolution of our company. We started off as stewardship services. Like I said, battery manufacturers pay us dues. They're the stewards to run a recycling program. So we then collect and recycle batteries around the country. 
as we became kind of experts in understanding the compliance and the safety and packaging of that, we began to get requests for return programs. For example, Dell Computers, we have a returns program with them where they send us addresses of customers who need have a battery in their home that needs to be recycled, and we directly ship um, envelopes with permitting and labeling and shipping and so forth included directly to the customer, and then they can just ship the batteries to us and we recycle it automatically. As we've kind of got into that program, we began to get into the fire safety program. Um, we've got a product called Cell Block, which has to do with extinguishing lithium fires, which I'm going to cover later on. So we've kind of become fire safety experts when it comes to battery handling. Your waste facility will probably go through something similar. You might be doing collecting or recycling right now. In the future, you may be shipping packaging directly to customers. That's something we're really exploring, especially since COVID-19 has come out and a lot of people don't want, especially elderly and immune compromised people don't want to visit a recycling facility. Um, we're going to start shipping packages directly to people and your facility might start doing that soon too. Fire safety protection is definitely going to be something your facility will also get into. As more and more of these batteries and devices come out, um, fire safety will become one of the, the most important issues for your facility. So a little bit about where does used battery go? We pick it up at a collection site. It's usually transported FedEx or UPS off into one of their warehouses. It's then transported again. Um, it goes to a sorting facility, which sorts the batteries by chemistry type first. And then um, from there, it goes to a processing facility, which actually processes those batteries. Some of them are, gr are ground up mechanically. Others are essentially dissolved with solutions. Some are um, melted through thermal properties. Um, and then they get turned into basically their essential elements, could be cobalt or iron or what have you. And those uh, metals and materials are sold on the commodity market and turned into new products. The big thing is safety is really important at every step. At every step, there's a human being transporting, sorting, um, processing these devices. And so we take safety seriously for the whole downstream process. Batteries are turned into new products. For example, lead batteries are the most recycled product in America. About 95% of lead batteries are recycled into new lead batteries. Other batteries materials are turned to stainless steel pots and pans, golf clubs, silverware. A small bit ends up actually in asphalt for roads. The important thing is that no batteries that we deal with go to landfill domestic or overseas. And that's something we really pride ourselves on. We are R2 certified, which stands for Responsible Recycling. Uh, this comes from the Sustainable Electronics Recycling International, the CIRI. Um, to get this, we are audited every year. It's a very strict auditing process, but what this means is that we ensure that none of these batteries end up overseas, especially in third world developing countries, that all of this is handled in the best way environmentally and socially um, throughout the process. So we're really proud to be the first battery um, recycler that got this certification. Our downstream process, which is everything uh, from the time the battery is collected through to sorting and processing, we're really auditing that ourselves. So for example, we require safety training. Any site that wants to recycle batteries has to go through our online safety program. Uh, we audit boxes continuously to see if there's been a fire during shipping. And if there is a fire, we will retrain that site and we'll retrain them again. If eventually th these fires continue to happen, we will suspend and even terminate a site. We also do a lot of communications um, outreach uh, nationally, also within the state of Vermont. Uh, we work really close with facilities and uh, Department of Environmental Conservation on training, safety training. Um, and so that's something we take importantly because you have to educate the consumers and the waste facilities, the collectors on how to handle batteries. And finally, we do a number of research projects into how to change consumer behaviors, how to increase recycling, how to do better training and so forth. Our research has shown that there are two main reasons why people don't recycle batteries. Number one is they don't know what to do with them. And number two, it's inconvenient. And these seem to happen nationwide, and we've specifically done studies in Vermont where this is definitely true. So if you want to increase recycling at your facility, 
the two simplest things you can do is number one, let people know what to do with their batteries. And that could be through social media, it could be through signs, um, it could be through newsletters. The second thing is to make it convenient that if they show up at your facility on a busy Saturday and they look around, if they can't find the battery section, if there's no signs on what to do when they arrive and they can't get a hold of an attendant because they're busy, they may just throw them in a dumpster or recycling bin. And that's really dangerous because lithium batteries can catch on fire. So you got to make it really s simple, convenient for them to drop it off and then go home. If it's not obvious what to do with them and it's not simple to do three things happen number one people hoard batteries in their house it could be in a drawer or a bucket this obviously isn't safe because then you could have a house fire they could also throw them in the trash which is dangerous because then it could end up in a compactor and, and burn down a truck or a facility or they may want to do the right thing and do wishful recycling where they just throw the batteries in the blue recycling bin and hope they get recycled. This is actually really dangerous because you could have lithium batteries go into a shredder for paper, which is essentially the perfect fire kindling to start a big fire, um, and other machines that um, could cause these lithium batteries to, to combust. So it's really important to educate um, consumers on the best way to dispose and recycle their batteries. One thing we try to do is make it really easy for people to find where to take their batteries. So if they Google battery recycling, they'll find our website. They can go and find a locator. They type in their zip code or their address and it will show all the closest sites to their address. Um, some of them may be a Lowe's, a Home Depot or a hardware store. Some of them may be a waste facility, but we try to make it really easy to find us and access these facilities. Our, our site also tells what types of batteries or cell phones are collected um, and it can also post the store hours. So if you've got a waste facility, um, go into our locator, see if you're in there, check, make sure the hours and days are right and let me know if anything needs to be changed because we want that to be accurate so consumers show up when there's someone there. When they get to the facility, one of the most important things is signage. <clears throat> this is actually um, in Vermont. Um, it's great because there is a giant poster that we provide which says batteries are recycled here. The only problem is it's on the back of this um, sign. So all the cars drive in and they see the hours of the facility on the other side, but they don't actually know that batteries are recycled because their cars drive in this way. So they're missing the signs. So again, you have to make it really clear that this is one of the most important safety products you're going to deal with. And every time someone visits your facility, they need to know that batteries are recycled there and where to put them. The same thing with your website. It should be really clear on your website that you accept batteries, what types of batteries and how to bring them in and where to put them so that it is obvious what to do and how to do it. A little bit on batteries, there's two basic battery types. Primary is one and done. You use it once, it can't be recharged. And then there's rechargeable, you use it more than once. You can re remember it by the Latin roots. Prime means one, like prime, like the best steak would be a prime rib, um, number one. And re means repeat, reuse. So primary is batteries that use once, rechargeable, you keep using them over and over again. The problem is it's hard to identify batteries these days. Number one, a lot of them come from overseas, so they're improperly labeled. You can't even tell the chemistry type. Um, when my daughter gets birthday presents, I always open them up to see what types of batteries. I can't identify the battery types anymore. A lot of them are made overseas in China and so forth, and you just can't tell because it's it's it might not be in English or it might not even be called out. Um, so chemistries are hard to identify. It's hard to know what a lithium battery is um, in when it comes in these toys and packages and so forth. And then another problem is counterfeit batteries. For example, these two batteries, one is an original Canon battery and the other is a counterfeit. And they are identically manufactured. Their labels are identical, their fonts and everything. The only difference is one has got a little darker blue, one's a little lighter blue. The problem is the the counterfeit is not made to the same high quality standard. So a lot of people are ordering these batteries off the internet, but they're poorly manufactured, and then they've got a higher chance of having a fire. 
So you always want to buy your batteries from a trusted source and try to avoid counterfeit batteries, but it's going to make it a challenge when these batteries come into your facility to actually understand what type they are. And every battery has to be checked and sorted and packaged properly to recycle. So in Vermont, we recycle primary batteries, which is unique. Vermont is the only state in the country with a primary battery recycling law that makes it free for every Vermonter to recycle batteries. And it has worked really well. Right now, Vermonters recycle the most primary batteries per capita in the entire country. And that's come through uh, the hard work of the Department of Environmental Conservation. And we are um, fortunate to be the stewardship organization that helps run this program. So you're going to get a lot of primary batteries being recycled by Vermonters. There's two types really that you're going to see. The first is alkaline. These are kind of your standard batteries that um, you see every day. And then the newer ones are the lithium primary batteries. A lot of these are going to come in the form of coin cells and button cells. Some of them may also look like these sort of traditional alkaline batteries, which makes them harder to distinguish. They're usually kind of a little shorter and more stubby. But lithium primary batteries do have a fire safety issue and they're becoming more pre prevalent. A lot of the devices that are coming out are running on lithium primary batteries. Between 2018 and 2019, the amount of lithium primary batteries in Vermont that were recycled jumped 100% in one year. And that trend is probably going to continue moving forward. So it's going to be really important to catch these batteries and prevent them from becoming a fire safety issue. These are the recyclable batteries that we, where we recharge, or that we recycle. Uh, nickel cadmium, lithium ion, these are typically in tools and so forth, nickel metal hydride, small sealed lead acid. A lot of these will be in um, like exit signs for hotels and that need to be powered during emergency and so forth. Uh, nickel zinc batteries. Nickel cadmium, nickel hydride, a lot of these are being phased out because lithium ion has become so much more powerful and affordable. So most of the batteries that we recycle weight wise in the country are tools now like drills, impact drivers, uh, chainsaws, table saws. You're going to see more and more of these batteries getting bigger and bigger and electric bicycles, um, drones, that type of stuff. So expect to see more lithium. They're less toxic. Um, compared to say nickel cadmium, but they're more dangerous. All the batteries we recycle have to be less than 11 pounds. So we don't do large car batteries like the large lead batteries that be in your vehicle. Uh, we do everything that's less than 11 pounds. Those bigger batteries are really handled by people who specialize in lead. Um, so everything has to fit into our box, which makes an 11 pound weight limit. It's important that the terminals, um, which are the contact points where the electricity flows on a battery, are protected for rechargeable batteries. Um, because these batteries can hold a re residual charge even when they appear to be dead. And if these terminals come in contact where they're being shipped and they're bouncing around in a truck, you know, going over a rough road, when those terminals make contact with each other, other batteries, a piece of metal, they can spark and cause a fire. So when in doubt, protect. What's interesting is um, in larger batteries, the terminals are really far apart. Like a car battery could be like nine inches apart between the positive and negative terminals. In contrast, um, a really small coin cell, it's a fraction of an inch between the positive and terminal con negative contacts. So those smaller batteries can actually be more dangerous because they're easier to short. So you have to pay attention to all batteries to make sure that um, they are packaged properly for shipping. The basic principle is that there's one rechargeable battery per bag or taped. So our boxes come with clear plastic bags that are self-sealing for putting um, batteries into, and that protects the terminals. Um, if you don't have bags, the best thing to use is um, packing tape, clear packing tape, just wrap it around the device so that both um, contact terminals are covered. Um, and again, it's one battery per package or per tape, per bag or per tape. This is what it looks like, uh, the packing tape. You can see that it wraps all the way around and covers both terminals so they can't have any contact. These smaller devices, we do what's called a ravioli. So you lay out a, a clear piece of packing tape, you put all the coin cells on there, and then you lay a second piece of tape over that. And that's the fastest and safest way to package these um, lithium primary batteries. Again, 
these can combust if they're damaged. So you have to do this properly with every single battery. That means every battery has to be picked up and managed. It's a lot of work and we really empathize with um, facility employees who have to do that, but it's really important and we appreciate them taking the time to do it properly. When you pack the batteries, don't put anything else in our boxes. So no grocery bags, no paper bags, no paraffin. Um, and when you tape a contact terminal, don't use painter's tape, masking tape, or scotch tape. Those will peel off during transport, and then you're just going to have a fire safety issue. Um, so use clear packing tape. If you don't have that, the only other tape I would recommend would be black electrical tape. We don't really like that because it's not see-through. So when it arrives at a sorting facility, it's hard for um, the attendant to dif differentiate what type of battery it is. So the best two choices are clear plastic bags like we provide with our boxes or clear packing tape. We've done a lot of research and development into containers for shipping batteries. And this is our box. This is a patented box. It has a patented uh, fireproof liner in it. We hired one of the top design companies in the country to design it. Um, it is approved to hold 66 pounds of batteries and it can still be dropped from four feet high. So it's very robust. It won't break during transport. It also has a pop-up display for countertops and hardware stores and stuff, which uh, makes it a little nicer um, um, from a design standpoint. And again, this is no cost to businesses or municipalities, municipal facilities in Vermont. Um, and this is really important. Never feel that um, you're getting low on boxes and you don't want to order them because of the cost. They're free. We can send you pallets of boxes for free. So all you have to do is reach out to me or go to calltorecycle.org and just order more. And we will send as many as you want. It's already paid for by the stewards who pay into the program in Vermont. So we just want to keep your facility safe. Like I said, this is a patented flame retardant liner. It's been third party tested to withstand fires up to 1100 degrees. A typical lithium fire, I believe, is around 700 degrees. So we've got a great buffer there. Um, no fire has ever breached these boxes yet, knock on wood. We probably get a few fires every month um, that we audit. And then we go back and make sure um, whoever sent those batteries are retrained. But so far, it's been a great device for handling these batteries. It keeps everything contained inside so it doesn't burn down a truck or facility. And then when it arrives at our sorting center, they can investigate it, take photos. And we do take photos and document every incident just to make sure we can always be using best practices. So let's talk about what a DDR battery is. Now, this is a very specific term that applies to lithium batteries only. So it stands for damaged, defective, recalled lithium batteries. So a battery that's been damaged that's a lithium battery has a high chance of combustion. A defective battery that may have been manufactured improperly can also combust. And then a recalled battery um, has already been determined probably to, to be damaged or defective. So now you've got a manufacturer recalling those batteries. So a DDR battery applies to lithium batteries only. It is a Department of Transportation code, um, which says that it's basically illegal to ship these batteries without proper packaging and permits. There's no such thing as another type of DDR battery. So uh, I just want to quickly differentiate this. The EPA determines what a hazardous waste is. For example, a nickel cadmium battery um, is very toxic. So you wouldn't want that in a landfill um, and into drinking water and so forth. So hazardous waste would be a nickel cadmium battery but it's not very dangerous. Department of Transportation determines a hazardous material as opposed to a hazardous waste. These are materials that are dangerous for transporting. And this would be a lithium DDR battery. So lithium is not a hazardous waste by the EPA standards. It, it could be thrown into a landfill. It's not very toxic, but it is dangerous. It's a hazardous material according to the DOT. Um, so with that, there's specific codes on how to transport a damaged lithium battery. If you want to learn more about lithium batteries, uh, one of the great things we did recently, the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation wanted a Vermont specific lithium fact sheet. That's available on the DEC website and I highly advise everybody download it. It's not very long, um, but it's bullet points of exactly how to deal with lithium batteries. 
Um, we worked with them to help them develop that. So we feel confident that it's very compliant and safe. A few basic bullet points uh, for your facility or for customers that may call you when they have a DDR battery. Number one, do not touch the damaged lithium battery with your bare hands because again, it can get very hot and burn you. Immediately bring the battery outside and step away to avoid inhalations. So you want to have that battery outside, say on a pavement surface like a driveway, and then step back because it's going to release gases that can be toxic and you don't want to inhale those. If possible, then place that battery into a container and fill it with sand or kitty litter or dirt, something that will contain that battery because when they burn, they can shoot off sparks or they can start to flip around or move. Um, so you want to keep it contained and kind of immobile. So kitty litter, sand, dirt, you can pack it in there and it will, it will not extinguish the fire, but it will contain it and keep it from spreading. And then a, a customer can contact their local solid waste management district, a municipality, or go to our website or call us and we can walk them through how to dispose of that. And that goes for the waste facility too. If you ever have a DDR battery, just reach out to us. We have customer service standing by all the time who is ready to assist. If you do have a DDR battery, you can go to our online store and order DDR kits and other um, uh, safety, lithium fire safety products. You don't even need an account for this. You can get on, order it, put in a credit card and we'll ship it. Um, so if you don't have an account with us, still feel free to do it. Um, it's all there to keep you safe. When you get on there, you will see our cell block DDR kits. So this is specifically for handling a DDR lithium battery, a, a damaged lithium battery. These kits are approved by the DOT for recycling. We have a special permit for recycling um, these dangerous batteries with this. It's all prepaid for shipping and recycling. So basically you would get online our website, you order this kit, it arrives at your facility, you put the battery in, you pack it with um, the cell block material, which I'm going to discuss in a minute. Um, you seal it up, it's pre-permitted, pre-labeled um, for shipping, there's already a sticker for FedEx or UPS, and you just call them, they take it away, and you're done. So it makes it really easy um, to get rid of these dangerous batteries. A little bit about that cell block material. So cell block is one of the most important products to hit the battery industry um, in the last few years. We have partnered with them to become their exclusive distributor for uh, waste facilities in the country. This is a fire suppression material. So it's made out of 100% recycled glass, which is great for the environment. But this glass is manufactured in a special way. Basically, it has tiny air bubbles, microscopic air bu bubbles infused into the glass, which makes it almost like a solid sponge. And this has three important effects. Number one, as, the gla as these glass beads are poured on a fire, they melt, they go from a solid to a liquid. And when they go through that process, they suck heat out of the fire. So with a lithium battery, battery you wanna stop thermal propagation. You wanna stop that heat from spreading from battery to battery to battery, because it can get very hot very quickly and be hard to stop. So cell block sucks the heat out and stops that chain reaction. The second thing that it does is it handles the fuel. So these tiny air bubbles make a huge surface area, kind of like, your stomach has a lot of folds in it. Even though your stomach is small, there's so many folds in it that it actually is a huge surface area for absorbing food, similar to your lungs. Your lungs have a lot of these alveoli, which are these little nodules, which dramatically increase the surface area of your lungs. Well, these small bubbles and cell block um, create a huge surface area which sucks the fuel, the electrolytes out of the fire that basically absorbs it. By taking that fuel out, you're cutting off the fuel for the fire and helping it get extinguished. And then finally, these glass beads also melt. They melt around the battery and create a silicate coating, and that cuts off oxygen from the outside, which a fire needs to keep burning. So by removing heat, by removing fuel, by cutting off oxygen, this extinguishes the fire, which makes it better than sand, it makes it better than vermiculite, it makes it better than pretty much any fire product out there right now. So that's why we really like it. It is rated as a class D fire extinguisher, which specifically is rated for lithium ion battery fires and these combustible metal fires. So it's perfect for what we're trying to do. 
So what I think every facility should have at a minimum, we sort of call it a lithium fire incident kit. Um, because you're going to see probably a 500% increase in these lithium batteries coming to your facility in the next five years. That really, you could say, means a 500% increase in fires possibility. Um, so you want to start thinking how to prepare your facility for lithium fires. Number one, if there is a fire, you're going to want some fireproof gloves so you can pick up a battery um, that may be smoldering, combusting. Uh, you probably want a mask and some goggles for the same issue to keep sparks from getting in your eyes or from um, gases getting into your lungs. You want to put that battery in a safe place. You take this PED pad, um, which is filled with cell block EX with those glass granules, and you put it right over the battery. These melt and then suffocate the battery fire. Then you've got a fire safety blanket, which is bigger than a PED pad, which you can spread out. It's a few feet wide. That keeps sparks from flying around the facility and catching you know, other products on fire like paper and so forth. And then when the battery is extinguished, you put it into one of our DDR kits, you fill it with this cell block material, you package it up and you ship it. So this is something you wanna have on your facility at all times in the future. For storing lithium batteries, for transporting lithium batteries, we do have some bigger bulk options. Um, we have poly drums which you can put lithium batteries into and then fill it with cell block EX with those glass granules. That creates a very safe storage and shipping option. We also have cell block drums that are double walled. Um, within the double wall lining is that cell block EX, those glass granules, and the, the walls are perforated. So if you have a fire within that, those cell block um, granules are going to suck all the gases out, all the toxic gases and so forth. And if you fill it with cell block EX, it will also extinguish the fire. And these come in various different sizes. We are getting facilities ordering some of these smaller um, containers just to store their batteries and battery devices. Uh, they just feel better going home at night knowing that all these batteries are stored in a cell block container. They don't have to worry about a fire during the middle of the night. Um, and then they can just take the batteries out when they're ready to sort them. Um, to package them, to ship them for recycling. So these are great storage options. They can also be used for bulk shipping and so forth. And again, these are all pre-permitted. So you don't need a, a, a permit to ship, to ship these. The permit's included when you buy it. That brings me to the end of my demonstration. Uh, thank you for listening. Our goal, as I talked about, was to help you see battery recycling as both environmental management and risk management. That's something we take seriously and that's going to become more commonplace in the future. If you have any questions, please email me day or night. That's my email address right there. I'm happy to walk you through steps. I'm happy to help you get the products you need. Uh, just answer technical questions. Our goal is to keep Vermonters safe and um, to just make it as easy as possible. And we appreciate all that you do. So thanks for listening and hope to meet all of you soon.